This is the case for Kenneth Vickers, DSC 376309. We have Margaret Briscoe, the victim's sister, who will be speaking in opposition. Houston Vickers, the son, who will be speaking in support. Dana Galvin, victim's sister, who will be speaking in opposition. Nicole Duglishe, victim, who will be speaking in opposition. And Ashlyn Vickers, daughter, who will be speaking in support. Oh. Thank you. Mr. Vickers, um, for the record, would you introduce yourself to everybody? Tell us your name and DOC number. My name is Kenneth Houston Vickers, Jr. My number is 376309. All right, and you should be able to see all the members of the pardon board on your screen. Let me introduce myself. I'm Cheryl Renatza. Um, my colleagues are Mr. Tony Marabella, Mr. Victor Jones, Mr. Alvin Roche, Mr. Jim Wise, and uh, I will read some identifying information into the record. Then I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Jim Wise as your case has been assigned to him. He'll start the interview process. When we finish the interview, we'll hear from the warden there at uh, Angola, and then we'll hear from all the people who've indicated they'd like to speak today. At the very end, you'll be allowed to make a statement before we vote. Okay? Yes, so you are Kenneth. H. Vickers Jr., DOC 376309. Yes, You're here this afternoon requesting the commutation of your sentence. Yes, uh, you were sentenced in 2003 in Evangeline Parish for three counts of manslaughter. You received a 40 year sentence on each of those counts. So your total DOC sentence, um, and those are consecutive. So your total DOC sentence is 100. 20 years. Yes, Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Would you answer Mr. Wise, please? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Victor, good evening. I, uh, good evening to each and everyone that uh, attended the hearing today. I was, you know, <laughs> you know, you, you were uh, on 5802, your offense. That's when your offense occurred. That's when the, all this occurred and on 5802 uh, was the same day you were arrested and you were sentenced on 3 7 2003 to 40, 40, 40 consecutive. That's 120 years, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. During this time, you, uh, Grand Jury Bill, indicted you. Uh, did the grand jury the charge that they they put on you uh you were charged of the murder of of brandy victors michelle arcon and jennifer ledger is that correct jennifer leger and michelle o'quin yes sir yeah it was all first degree murder the grand jury come back with and then the judge give you the manslaughter is that correct three counts Yes, sir. How long have you been serving on this charge? It'll be 19 years next month. All right, this is something I want you to do, and I want you to speak to the board only. Tell me, were you on drugs? I don't know if I had any drugs in my system, but I was heavily intoxicated. I was a bad alcoholic. I know that's not okay. no excuse. Well, tell the board a little. Tell the board a little bit of what happened. About leading up to that, or I know yeah, what happened up. because you. Uh, tell me what happened because you killing these three ladies. Uh, I'm not understanding what you saying, Mr. Jim. Is all right? Like there was three. They was they was three victims in this case that got killed. Yes, sir. What was the reason for this? There shouldn't have been a reason. I mean, I was. I well, was, what happened? Michelle, Jennifer, and Brandy got killed, and I can't remember pulling the trigger, but it don't make it right. 
Did you go to their house? I don't know. I remember bits and pieces throughout the day. I drank seven so forty. You don't know what happened. I can't say her truthfully and tell you what happened when I, I really don't know, but I took responsibility for it because I know if I wouldn't be messed up, I wouldn't be in prison right now. I mean, I, I hurt people. I hurt, I hurt all of them babies, took their mom, Nicole, Sammy, David, Miss Judy, Ryan, Anna, well, Justin, Caleb, I mean, I can't remember doing it, but I heard them, and I'm sorry. There was a 27-year-old, 34-year-old, and a 31-year-old. Did they have yes. children? That's who I was talking about. Each one of them? Well, Michelle had Justin, Caleb, and Ryan, and her brother was Michael. <clears throat> and Jennifer had Anna, and then my wife had our three kids. Well, you don't know why you went over there or what happened? All I know is I was in a bad state of mind. I let... When I was three, I'm mom, trying to ask you straight up if you knew of it, if you knew of anything that happened or the reason why these victims got killed. That's all. That's all I asked. I don't know how to explain that, Miss Jim, but I can't remember. I've I've found out stuff after David's trial that I didn't know, but it, he had told me when my wife come back to the house one day and told me I need to do something with my friend that he threatened to kill her and Shelly on the side of the road for getting in his business. And I just laughed it off and and told him she was a big girl. She was on her own with me and her wasn't together no more because she was living on one side of the house. I was living on the other side of the house. And it went at that, but I found out after I played guilty and got, I played guilty because I can't, I couldn't see me hurting kids or anybody like that. I, I know that ain't me. But apparently uh, it had, uh, how many disciplinary write-ups, how many disciplinary write-ups do you have? None. See, you've done real well since you've been there. Drugs has not been your problem. What, what programs are you taking for alcohol or drugs? I'm not taking any right now. I had got with Miss Amber and uh, found out there's a new program at Camp F, but I can't attend it right now because of the COVID. All right, when you can, you need to attend every program you can get your hands on. Uh, I, I know you've done some positive things since you've been there. Are you a trustee there at the prison? Yes, sir. I live what at do the you Canine do there? I live uh, at the Canine, what? PC, Canine Training Facility. Uh, All right, let me speak to the warden there. Uh, uh, no. Warden the Martineer, is there anything you can say on his behalf? Yes, sir, I sure can. Uh, uh, Linda Vickers has been at the double pen for the past. Uh, on him seven years. Uh, since he's been here, he has zero write-ups. He has taken, he's an NOBTS graduate. He's going to victim awareness, 100 hours, things so have changed, Malachi dads, inside and out dads, anger management, substance abuse, uh, low tire score. Um, he's on several outside crews that help secure emergencies in times of hurricanes. He has volunteered and has been taken to um, Many projects off the farm with the West Louisiana Sports Park, with the 4-H Club here, helping them put together for their shows. Um, has gone to the Governor's Mansion on several occasions and worked. Um, has 
absolutely zero problems since he's been here. And like I said, since he's been at the dog pen, it's just uh, really, really worked. And uh, worked with the community here at Angola and, and has been extraordinary offender and had no other problems, though, that I can say. Uh, I've talked to him on several occasions about his uh, case and, uh, you know, it, it has, has confided in me of his alcoholism and alcohol problem when he was drinking to blacking out and couldn't remember. But I've asked him about the case several times and trying to figure out what's going on. And uh, but uh, as far as what he's done since he's been here, he's been a, a model, model prisoner. Okay. Thank you. I don't have any other questions. Thank you, Mr. Wise. Uh, Mr. Marabella. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. Mr. Vickers, uh, tell me how you intend on dealing with your alcohol problem. Sir? Tell, tell, me, you... tell me how you intend on dealing with your alcohol problem if you were somehow to be released. I would plan on getting help. I'd have to find a support group because I'm... I'm an alcoholic. I ain't touched nothing since I've been locked up, but I'm always going to be an alcoholic. Yeah. And it's a disease. What program have you taken? I understand there's a program that you're hoping to get into and hoping to take. What have you taken currently that has to do with substance abuse? Uh, the, the last thing I took, I took the living imbalance. All right. And I think and what did you learn? What did you learn? Ooh, there's more ways to cope with life than just turning to the bottle. And I know what made me turn. What? Sir? What? Well, when I was three, my dad got charged with manslaughter for killing my mama. When he got out, uh He had a stroke riding a motorcycle, and me and my two sisters and my grandpa got in the back of the truck. We was going to ride to the hospital with him because my uncle was going to drive. He had a camper, and I got back there to be with my daddy. And my grandma made me get out. And about 35 minutes later, we got a call saying that my two sisters had got killed. And then a week, and then a week later, my grandpa died. And so I really, I grew up without my mama and really without my daddy because we were disconnected because I felt so much hate for him in my heart. It was like a disease that just would eat away at me. And then my cousin, Kurt, he took me under his wing and I, I was feeling like a sense of normalcy. And then he got killed. And my two older sisters had done moved out the house and I felt alone. Well, that, that certainly is a lot of tragedy, and I, 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 I certainly and I, sympathize with, with I, what you went through. I mean, that's horrible. Right. My, my, I, I guess my, my concern is how are you going to deal with your problems without drinking? Because I, I changed my inner man. I gave it all to Jesus. Everything. Well... And, and that's a good thing, but you got to have some tools and you've got to have some positive beliefs or understanding on what you're going to do when times get bad. Do you have a plan? Yes, sir. What is, which is what? All my family's there to support Besides me. Besides your family. I have, if I'd get out, I'd be living right next door to a state trooper. He worked. Mr. Clay shoots. He would give me a place to live. He'd be my how, support. 
Mr. Schutz is not going to be able to stop you from drinking. Your family is not going to be able to stop you from drinking. What are you going to do to stop you from drinking? I'm not going to drink. I'm going to okay. take all the classes I can to help me not drink. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Vickers. That's all I've got. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Mirabella. Um, Mr. Jones? Mr. Vickers. Mr. Vickers, can you hear me? Uh, a little bit. It goes in and out. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. The three victims, how long had you known these people? I known Michelle from about maybe ninth to tenth grade, and I knew Jennifer when they first moved to Louisiana. I think we were both fifteen, and then my wife. I knew her probably since she's about thirteen. Okay. Okay, and now how long you and your wife have been married? Uh, I think 10 years. 10 years, and how long had you all been separated when this crime occurred? Um, I'm not for sure. Now you blame this incident on alcohol. No, sir, I don't blame nothing on alcohol. It's me. If I wouldn't have drank, the, but it, I didn't what, drink responsible and I became what, alcoholic. What was going on, uh, Vickers? What was going on the day of or the day before that even something like this would even cross your mind to do? What was going on? I'd been wanting to kill myself. I was in a dark place. It's just like, I don't know, all my hurt and everything was just like, I didn't need to be on this earth. Okay, you're in a dark place with yourself, but how about the victims? Where, where, did, where did they fit into that? I mean, me and Brandy was split up, and I was upset with her. She went and got a, uh, she got custody of our babies, and I was upset with her. And as far as Jennifer and Michelle, my two sisters, I told you, I lost. That's the two girls that. I always took feel their place for me. I, I love them. But, and you can't explain. You can't explain what would be in the back of your mind to take their lives. All I know is I wanted to kill myself. Have you ever dealt with any mental mental issues, uh, evaluations as a prior to this? Did you ever go get help? I went for drinking a couple times, but all I was doing was just pulling the wool over their eyes and my eyes too. Told them I wasn't gonna drink no more. And then it released me. Tragedy, all the tragedy and So you never reached out to try to get counseling or anything on your own? I think I'm losing the message, Chairman. Yeah, you're breaking up a little bit. Me? I can hear you, I'm, but you're breaking you know, up. I, yeah, I don't have any other questions. I'll just leave it there. Yeah, I think he asked you, uh, Mr. Vickers, but you never really reached out for counseling on your own? Yeah, I went to uh, Crossroads and uh, I think it's in Pineville. Mm -hmm. What I was saying is, I, I guess it wouldn't been on my own is more or less to appease my wife. Right. Okay. All right. Well, um, let's move on. Mr. Roche. Madam Chairman, I have no questions. All right. Thank you, Mr. Roche. Um, Let's hear from your son, Houston. Can we hear from you? 
Um, hello. Hi. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> oh Lord, I don't know what I'm supposed to say. Whatever comes to mind. Um. Did you ask me a question? I'm sorry. No, no. What would you like us to know about your father? Oh, um, I, I was five whenever it happened, and I do remember it. And I do remember there was a lot of alcohol involved. And since he's gone in prison, completely different man. He's always telling me to read my Bible. If I was bad, he always fussed at me. Okay. But, um... So he was pretty much still being a dad, even though he wasn't around, which I think I needed because I was a very tough child to deal with because I had a lot going on in my life, you know? And then I didn't help that whenever we moved, I had a similar situation happen down there too, to uh, me and my sisters with uh, one of our aunts overdosing. So him actually getting clean and getting that help that's how I'm going to see it. It took me a long time to forgive my dad, but he's the only parent I have. And I just want him back. Um, how do y'all talk like this? Um, I don't know. He's just a completely different person. Um, if you had compared them, I wouldn't have recognized the man he is today. And I don't think he deserves to be in prison anymore. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for um, sharing your thoughts with us. We appreciate it. Thank you. And I'm sure he does too. Okay. Well, um, could we hear from Ms. Dana Galvin? Hi. I did write a letter. I did email it to y'all. I'm not sure if y'all got it. Um, yes, we I did. May, we have it. I may skip through some because I do realize that um, it went from a victim impact statement to basically a survivor's impact story. Sure. Yeah, we do have it. My name is Dana Marie Galvin, younger sister to Brandy. Before that night in May 2002, I was very close to Kenneth. He was more like a brother to me than any of my other brothers at that time. We got along well for the most part, and I honestly don't remember any real fights between him and I, unless it had to do with my sister Brandy. I always tell everyone that night I lost more than just my, my, my sister. Facts about my sister, she was very short and petite, but wasn't afraid of anything at all. She was a great mother. She knew she always wanted to be a mother. She loved her coffee, Coca-Cola, despised milk. She carried me around so much when I was a baby, I didn't walk much until after I was one. I was her personal baby doll. She was four and a half years older than me. She always announced my pregnancies before I could. And she knew Kenneth was gonna kill her. I had a hard time forcing myself to sit and write this. It's the reason it's come last minute to y'all. I knew what it would entail. I knew I had to revisit a lot of pain and emotion. <laughs> that I thought I had already dealt with and stored away thinking this day would never come. However, here we are, less than 20 of his 120 year sentence, wondering what is actually going on, how and why. To tell you how that night has impacted me, my family, our lives is overbearing, to say the least. It's a, the night of the murders, I remember everything very vividly. Laying in bed, waiting for my then boyfriend to get out of the shower when his sisters when his sister hands me the phone it was Wayne the man that had raised us he said he did he did it he killed her 
honestly, my mind went straight to my mom thinking her husband killed her. But Wayne corrected me saying, no, Dana, Kenneth killed Brandy. I screamed very loudly. Um, on the way there, I screamed at my boyfriend to go, to drive, you know. I, I wanted to get there because I didn't believe that she was dead. I just, she couldn't have been dead. I even forced him to pass a sheriff's department car. Um, when I got there, it was very chaotic. I jumped out of my boyfriend's truck. I saw his two daughters standing in the front at his dad's house. They were covered with blood splatter on their nightgowns. I couldn't hardly understand anything they were saying. I ran to the house, fought with the cops, trying to get in to go you know, help my sister. The paramedics decided I needed a shot. I had seen Kenneth a few days. I'm not really sure how many days it was prior to this, broke down on the side of the road. Of course, I stopped to make sure he was okay. And I asked him if he needed me to do anything for him, guys, et cetera, whatever. I didn't know why he was there. He tells me no, so I ask him how he's holding up. His words were, I'm gonna kill that bee. I got upset and I tell him he needs to quit saying that crap. It's the you know exact reason he was in the predicament and situation he, you know, he was in. I told him he needed to let things calm down to give her some space and that I know he loves her and really didn't want to hurt her. He was just in a lot of pain. I made him look at me and promise he would do anything stupid. And he did, and he lied to me. He told me he loved me and he lied. While the ambulance was giving me a shot to calm me down, I looked and my youngest brother, Keith, had gotten past the cops while they were tending to me. I'm sobbing, I see his face, I know it's over and that she's gone. We're all sobbing and Keith tells me to definitely not go in there and regrets what he saw. We all wait until the coroner arrives to take their bodies. I beg to see my sister and they refuse. Just when the coroner was about to leave, they asked us who Jennifer was or asked about her address. I'm not exactly sure. Um, I, I was very confused, but I either confirmed um, or told, you know, confirmed her address or told them who Jennifer was. We grabbed the girls and I honestly can't remember if my brothers went get Houston or if I went with them. I'm not, I, I don't remember much after that. I know we gathered at Wayne's. I took the gowns off the girls and I made sure to bag them. I sat and I tried to listen to everything they said and I let them cry and I let them lay on me and I let them just express whatever they needed to. There was a lot of blur after that, no sleep. I was five months pregnant. Um, I ended up almost losing the baby, but I did not. I had to go to the doctor to get on sedatives while I was five months pregnant because I just, I could not deal. I was already not in a good place in my life. And this just, it made it so, it made it so much worse. I was mad at the world. When my son was born, I decided to give him up for adoption. I couldn't do it. Mentally, I, I couldn't do it. I lied to my family and not to I lost him and because I didn't want to face them. Everybody was hurting so bad. Nobody, none of us were okay. None of us. The truth came out. And of course, you know, 
they started ugly things about me saying, you know, I sold him. I, I don't know why they said that. There was absolutely no money. I had no car, nothing. Um, certain family members were angry with me because I didn't come to them or keep them in the family, you know, but how could I? Nobody was okay. At this point, a lot of nightmares start in my dreams of there. Kenneth gets there and either I kill him in the dream or he kills me. Ms. Galvin, we'll need you to wrap it up for us. We're running out of time. August of that next year, my little brother killed himself. Um, he developed schizophrenia. My daughter witnessed the suicide. Um, I then decided to forgive Mr. Vickers, Mr. Vickers. Um, in 2007, our other little brother got into a wreck and was killed. Our mom passed away exactly two years after that. I miss my sister every day that she is not here. There was a domino effect of deaths in my family that followed that night. There isn't a word that describes what my family has endured directly and indirectly from that night. I, I do realize his kids want him out. And I've never ever told his kids to hate him. In fact, one of his, his oldest daughter, who I'm very close with, did hate him for a long time. And I preached to her several times, you know, that it was her father and it was okay to forgive him because I had, and it was a huge release. And Kenneth knows how I have forgiven him. I felt very betrayed. And I will never be okay with his release until I, he can tell me everything that happened that night. I was okay, blamed thank for you, several Ms. things. Thank you, we appreciate your participation today. We, we need to give the other ladies an opportunity to speak, we're running out of time. Ms. Uh, Duplichang, Nicole, Yes. We'd like to hear from you. Well, Kenneth was like a brother to me too. He was like a little brother. My brothers was grown and off. And this is, this really, I, I don't understand because we was all so close. And I know that there's other factors involved in the situation with what went down that night. But in talking to Kenneth after it happened through letters, this could have been stopped with a phone call. He told me, you know, you don't know how many times I wanted to come tell you and either I was high or y'all was gone. Months, months, this could have been stopped. Why I, I have trouble believing that Kenneth solely acted on Jennifer by himself. I just don't believe that. This could have been avoided. And if, and if the truth had come out like it should have, this could have turned out different. I mean, he still would be doing, I mean, he's just as guilty, just as guilty. And our families are forever destroyed and never will be the same. All these children have emotional trauma and baggage that it's gonna be hard for them to deal with. I mean, they're at, a, they're at an age right now, you think they need their mothers. And as much as I love my niece, like my own, she needs her mama and she can't help it. And I'm not, I'm not the same. I love her like my daughter, but there's things she's been through that she needed her, her actual mother. Same thing with all these other kids. The families have been destroyed. The families have gone through years and years of emotional, like every time you think you get to a point where you, you're gonna be okay. And then something like this comes and just like, just it's like fresh wound all over again. 
this is hard to heal from, even though I have forgiven both Kenneth and the other person involved because I had to in order to heal. That doesn't take away the fact that they did wrong. And, and just because you forgive somebody doesn't mean it's forgotten and that they don't have to pay for what they did. You, you have to take an I, I hope I hope Kenneth is in a, a good place finally. And I hope he's leading his life right. And I hope he's right with God, like he says he is, you know. That doesn't take away the fact that he did a horrific thing and he needs to be held accountable. I love him like a brother and this pained me. I mean, I was, devastation is an understatement. Love him, forgive him. You still have to pay for what you did. You know? I, I don't know what else. I, I don't want to go too deep with my feelings here because I think I'm finally getting to a place where I can maintain. But there's, it's not fair. It is not fair that he would get out and go have Thanksgiving with his family and I have to go to the cemetery. Mm -hmm. I'll never be able to talk to my sister. I'll never be able to hug her. Why, why would he not have to pay for what he did? You know, mm -hmm. I don't know what else to say. I mean, I'm, That's I don't we, we, we appreciate you um, sharing with us and we understand your position. We have uh, Miss Margaret Briscoe who's joined us. We'd like to hear from, uh, from you. I'm sorry, you're on mute. You'll have to unmute your microphone. Sorry about that. Okay. Good afternoon. Yes. My name is Margaret Briscoe, and I am the oldest sister to Michelle Oprah, and one of the one, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the three victims murdered. I was asked by my family and friends to speak on behalf at this hearing and convey that we are in opposition to the pardon of Kenneth Vickers Jr. I looked up the definition of what pardon is the actual definition of, and it's the action of forgiving or being forgiven for an error or offense. I believe that this is way beyond an error or offense. I do not know the family, did not know anything about them. I never had heard of his name until the night of the murder. So I really have no knowledge of their family, only rumors of the family. And I just think that it's an injustice to the memory of these three women that we have to stand before you on this Zoom call and plead that the murderer of our loved one remains behind bars and that he completes his sentence and serves the sentence that was given to him by a judge in the court of law. Michelle did not get her chance in life to be a daughter to my mother, never got a chance to be an aunt to my children, Heather and Josh, or a great aunt to my grandchildren. She would never see the fine young men that her three boys have grown into. Her oldest son, Ryan, did not get the chance to have his mother meet the person he chose to spend the rest of his life with and be at their wedding to celebrate their love. She never witnessed that her youngest son, Justin, became a police officer and dedicated his life to protect and serve others and prevent exactly this type of events that he witnessed firsthand by Kenneth Vickers Jr. Because yes, he was there during the horrific murder of his mother while he stood there at the young age of three and watched his mother be shot not once but twice by Kenneth Vickers Jr. and stand there terrified until authorities showed up. There is so much Michelle has missed out on and so much we, her family and friends have missed out on by her no longer being with us. It changed the course of all of our lives and he should not be afforded release from prison under no circumstances. I was told secondhand information that he's a changed man and I feel that that's a good thing if he is changed, that he should stay right where he is in prison among his fellow inmates, his peers, and he can use his newfound knowledge and changes to try and help people of his kind behind bars and not out living in society with the rest of the world that we choose to be law abiding citizens and we choose not to be criminals and we choose not to get angry and murder others. I believe that those three murders were premeditated related to the facts that he had a plan made out in advance that what he was going to do, he told people multiple 
multiple times of what he was planning on doing. He arrived at two separate houses and fatally shot three women. He borrowed a gun beforehand and he was angry because of a recent separation from his wife and being a restraining order was served on him and that Michelle and Jennifer were witnesses to the judge to get the restraining order against him because his wife did feel threatened by him as well as the judge knew that he was a threat to his wife. He pulled the trigger four times at two different locations in front of the children and then left those children behind with their dead mothers before them. And I cannot believe that survivors have to convince a panel of professional individuals on why this man who killed three women and now say he doesn't remember, he should not be able to use the excuse of alcohol, drugs, a crap hood, or any of his other excuses, a pending divorce, a separation. We all have issues in our lives, and but we choose to do the right thing. And where is 19 years even being considered that that is a debt to society that he has paid. That's less than a little more than six years per victim that he did that he has served so far. And I think he should stay behind bars the 120 years, which I know that's not feasible, but he should be amount in behind prison for the same amount of time our three loved ones, Michelle, Jennifer, and Brandy, will remain in their graves forever. He should remain behind bars forever as well. These proceedings have caused all of us to have to relive the tragic events that happened to our loved ones in May of 2002. And what little justice we believed in was that Kenneth Vickers Jr. received life in prison and was as hard as it was in a long time it has taken all of us to somewhat put their murders in our past and try to relive on we had with Michelle as a daughter, a mother, a sister, and an aunt. But instead the past has been dredged up and brought to our immediate attention on the pending anniversary of their deaths. Once again, we are forced to relive their horrific deaths and try to put into words good enough to convince you as to why this monster, Kenneth Vickers Jr., a cold-blooded killer, should never be released back into society. I hope I have succeeded as well as the other ones to convince you that you make the right and just decision so that Kenneth Vickers remains right where he is in prison for the rest of his life. After all, Michelle, Jennifer, and Brandy have no choice as to where they will remain. I would consider it to be cruel and an unusual punishment placed upon us, their survivors, if you, the members of the pardon panel, choose to release him back into society. We have no alternative to, to believe that the justice system has failed us if he is released. That is Thank all. you, Ms. Riska. Thank you. We appreciate uh, sharing that with us. Um, uh, Kenneth, is there something you'd like to say to the board? I'm sorry that y'all had to meet me like this. I am so sorry to my victim's family members. I know I can never, ever, never bring them back. All I can do is ask for your forgiveness. But I know, I know forgiveness is a process and it, it took me forever to forgive my daddy. And I hate it. I hated people from New Orleans, especially taxi cab drivers because that's who ran over my sisters. And I built that hate up in me and it just ate and ate and ate. And I beg of y'all's forgiveness. Please don't let hatred eat y'all up. Please. And I'm not asking to get out. I know I haven't done enough time. That wasn't what this is all about. I wanted to get right here and tell each one of my family members, each one of their family members, how sorry I am. I never met Michelle's oldest sister. I didn't even know she had an older sister. And I'm sorry. And if anything, I would, I would ask, um, like I said, I'm not asking to get out today, but if there's any way possible to give me, it's not really so much me, it's, it's my family, it's my kids, maybe 99 with parole eligibility after 34, that don't mean I'll get released. 
I'll just be eligible. Like right now, I'm coming before you. I'm not getting released. I just, I was watching a evangelical yesterday, and I, I pray and I asked the Lord to give me something out there I could use at this board. And I watched four different preachers, and he was he was preaching on how Christ Jesus he was healing people, as in our world, you know. We judge. I might look at that guy over there and say, I don't like what he's wearing. And different things like that. Well, he was talking about him healing people. And at the end, he asked this question. I'm going to ask you all this question. What would it be like if we looked at people through a life of mercy and grace instead of judgment? And again, I'm so sorry to everyone involved, the DA, the Sheriff's Department, my hometown, my home community, the board, all of my victims. I'm sorry. All right, Kenneth, thank you. All right. Um... Mr. Wise, this is your case. Are you prepared to vote? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Kenneth, I just, I just want to say this, uh, Kenneth, that, uh, and I want to tell the victim something real quick. There's going to be a time. I don't know when it'll be. If he stays where he is, he's doing good. He's, he's been a trustee for a long time and different things. But Kenneth, let me tell you something. You haven't done but about 15 or 20 percent of your sentence. And today I'm going to be denying you because of strong victims' opposition, law enforcement opposition, and also sufficient time that you serve. And I know you do a good job down there where you're at because I've seen you down there. And I'm going to thank each and every one here today. Thank you, Mr. Wise. Mr. Marabella. Mr. Vickers, uh, I think you need some more work on your alcohol problem. And you need to have a plan for when you get out. Uh, you need to understand and learn about yourself and your drinking and what your triggers are and what can stop you. You've had a very tragic life. I mean, no one questions that. Uh, the, the Listening to the family of the victims today, they've had a tragic life. You've caused a lot of pain to them. You're working hard and you're doing well. Right now is just not time. You haven't served sufficient time on a very long sentence, and that's a, that's a serious concern. But you're moving in the right direction. And there will be a time, perhaps not in the, the near future, but in the future, that you will be able to get out. Continue to do the things that you're doing. But today, my vote would be to deny you. Yes, sir. Thank you, uh, Mr. Marabella. Mr. Jones? Um, Mr. Vickers, I concur with my, co my colleagues here. I think it would help, you know, I think you choose to forget or want to block out what actually happened, what brought all this on. I know it would help me to know, I can't see anyone doing something of this nature without some reasoning for it. So I'd like for you to sit and think about that some and give some thought to it. Don't hide behind the alcohol. Um, but anyway, my vote today is going to be to denial for the same reason that's stated. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Mr. Roche. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Vickers. My decision is going to be the same thing, except because you have multiple victims opposed. You have the entire legal community opposed. 
you've only served 15% of your sentence. The judge would not have ordered your three counts of manslaughter to run consecutively if he didn't think it was a serious crime. And if you would take advice from an old guy, the strategy in which you use today will never work. I forgot, I don't know what happened. That's gonna never work with, with me sitting on the panel. You need to make up your mind, be forthcoming, to be truthful, because nobody, and I, I think you commented that you had 740s. And I know what 740s are, because I'm old enough. And you, murdered two individuals, then you rode all the way from Evangeline Parish to Allen Parish to kill the third victim. If you were completely out of it, you would have never made it to Allen Parish. You know exactly what happened. And when you come to terms with that, maybe next time you can be truthful. Madam Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Roche. <clears throat> uh, so, so you've received four unfavorable votes today, uh, Mr. Vickers. So the outcome of today's proceedings is that your application for clemency has been denied. Uh, I have to apologize. I, I failed to recognize Ashlyn Vickers who wanted to speak, but at this time, uh, we've we finished our proceedings, so I do apologize that I didn't call on her and recognize her. Uh, she did want to speak, I believe, in your behalf. Um, so um, I think that concludes our business at Angola this afternoon. Um, thanks, everybody, for your participation. Thank you, Warden Lamartineer, Warden Falgood. Uh, we'll adjourn from Angola at 432. What did I just watch? Is anyone else feeling entirely shocked, confused, like head is kind of exploding? Why he killed three people? Three in one night in two different locations. Innocent, unarmed woman. And they're talking about it like you have the victims that are like crying and express like how how me, like why would he get out? And they're like, how is this hearing even happening? How did Jim Wise elude? I think it was Jim that that he might get out one day. What? He killed three people with the gun. He he did it in front of infant children, in front of his own son. It's like we've all gone mad. <laughs> I'm watching this hearing and I'm just like, what is going on? I, I, I'm, I'm lack of sleep. I'm missing something. Where's the DA? You know, I get like with the questioning sucking entirely because Victor Jones and Jim Weiser, I think, goodness, they're no longer on their board. They're, they're something's maybe they're not healthy mentally. They're all there. I don't know. I, I just haven't yet. I haven't seen a, a ton of them, but I haven't seen any time where they've ever asked any type of normal string of questions yet. Uh, but maybe there's a reason they left the board. Uh, I'm, I say that respectfully. I think the board also knew from the start before the hearing ever started that it was going to be denied. But I, I just don't even understand. They're just like, why did it happen? I don't know.
And then it was just like this, I, I couldn't figure it out. And I, I, you know, even with the records that I have online, there's nothing much there. Imagine today if someone went to a home and did that, you to think that they'd be getting a, having a hearing to commute the sentence after 20 years? It doesn't make sense. And why did a judge let him plead a three manslaughter? It's not manslaughter. I I, I just don't understand it. It should be three life sentences, not even three 60-year sentences. Or not even three 40-year sentences. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make any sense. Out against those new laws reforming the state's criminal justice system. This comes after a man can, can in, connected, excuse me, to a 2002 triple murder in Evangel in Paris was released from the Allen Correctional Center this morning. And now the families are having to relive what happened on May 8th, 2002, over and over again. They spoke to News 10's Lester Jouet in a story you'll see only on 10. In 2002, three women, Brandy Vickers, Michelle Oquin, and Jennifer Leger, were murdered by Kenneth Vickers, who is now serving a 120-year prison sentence in Angola after pleading guilty to three counts of manslaughter. But David Leger was also charged with three counts of conspiracy to commit murder in that same case after he apparently ordered Vickers to kill some of those three women. And he was let out today as part of the new criminal justice reform, bringing back old wounds from the family of the three victims who now just want justice. It's not fair that the people can go home to their families and put their arms around their neck and we suffer and have to live through this over and over again. Locking arms with each other and fighting to hold back tears. The sisters of Jennifer and Brandy say David Leger, who was serving a 36 year sentence in prison for conspiracy to commit murder in the case, was let go early Wednesday. He gets to go sit with his family for Thanksgiving and he gets to go to Christmas and he gets to go to family functions. We go to the cemetery to see ours. They say this move is like a scab wound that every day gets worse and worse, knowing that Leger was more involved than authorities believe. Horrible gut feeling that David had so much to do with this, much more than what Kenneth had told us. Kenneth was married to Brandy. Michelle had a child with David Leger. Jennifer, the ex-wife of Leger, was going to take him to court for child support the next day after the murder occurred. Both women now feel justice hasn't been served. They failed all seven kids that their moms were taken that night. They failed my sister, they failed Jennifer, they failed Michelle, they failed our parents, they failed us as siblings, they failed everybody. They've spoken to their local representatives and the governor's office. Both offices apologized. Now all the women can do is pray their message gets across. David's out. Maybe they can stop the next one. Lester Dewey, Caliph Y News 10. Now, Dina and Nicole say they will keep fighting to make sure officials will better check the records of some of these prisoners before letting them free in the future, and they will do it in memory of their sisters. I've always had dreams. Uh... So apparently there was someone else involved. That's what I got from that. Uh, they will do a better job checking the records. Yeah, okay. They're just so full of it. They don't, you know, they don't. We know better. We know much better by now. But yeah, that's basically there was someone else involved. Uh, he had ordered him to do it. Like, there's just nothing. I can't really get anything meaningful out of this. I mean, Richard shared with me what was available, and it's just he pled three counts of manslaughter. And this is the David who ordered him to kill them, which doesn't even make that just doesn't make sense. He was let out today out of new criminal justice reform. This was in uh, 2017. So this these poor families had to deal with that in 2017, and then they had to go through this hearing in 2020. It, it just doesn't make sense. You know, there was so much death in this hearing. 
from all the different parties. It was completely and utterly overwhelming. It, 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 it was enough to last any single family 10 lifetimes of, of pain and trauma and, and it just, just horrible. And then the generational thing that he saw his father take his mother and then he did the same thing to his son. You just can't make this stuff up, man. He was pathetic with his talk, his gibberish. There's a, a Facebook post that that Richard shared and there's also a Spotify if you want to hear about more about the case I, I I didn't get a chance to listen to it but just the I'll put the link in the description I just don't understand it just don't understand it look at him He's sitting there like and his final speech is all about me 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 he was crying about me he started crying from the very beginning yeah you had a a a, a, a terrible life but you went and shot three women you're you're the mother of your child in front of children it just it's just, it blows my mind that you have the opportunity to even to that even a parole board member would say that one day you'll be free because you have a good record in prison. It's nuts. It's madness. It is pathetic speech about living life through the eyes of forgiveness and not judgment judgment you kill pretty woman i'm not judging you i'm identifying you as a dangerous dangerous liability a monster a sociopath a, a villain i'm not judging you that's what you are. You don't get a second chance from that. You don't, society cannot be put at risk. I think Mr. O'Shea said he blamed it on alcohol. How, how you you how do you what are you talking about? This wasn't like a bar fight where you're drunk and you pulled it out and you you, you this wasn't like in all the scenarios of he he went to two homes and he targeted his wife, the mother of his child, in front of the child. He did that and then he and then he did it to another woman in front of their child and it's like hey i guess one thing that the board did which we haven't seen you know maybe they did this more back in the day but they let the victims talk for much longer than they would normally talk now you might play if you want to play devil's advocate say she was saying, we need more time. This was the last hearing of the day. So in theory, she could have let them talk for as long as they wanted. It wouldn't have made a difference. Uh, now, th this was a long day for them. They, they were sitting in hearings for eight hours and two minutes, uh, just the recording time. And it's emotionally draining and all of that. And they did let them talk for longer than they normally would. Um, but we've seen them normally cut people off after three minutes.
just flat out three minutes. But anyways, I I'm emotionally drained. I've been I'm uh, I'm done for a little while. But it's this you 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 wouldn't believe it unless you've seen it. If I told you that someone 20 years ago did this and then they had a chance at freedom, you would say you're full of it. There's no chance. At least I would. I would. I would say I don't believe you. But now you see it. So you can believe it. And they put the families through this. It's unbelievable. It's just shocking. But and the idea that he might somehow get free now better not ever have a chance. Because that that is just it's just another crazy situation waiting to happen. I I, I don't I can't. But anyways, with that, I'll let you go.